Okay, everybody ready? We're all good, good morning. Apologies for uh, a little late start. I, uh, I got in late last night so I couldn't pick up my packages. I kind of knew when I was speaking but I didn't know where I was speaking and uh, I talked to the IDEA guys uh, last night. I knew where I was going for the first session. They said, well after that come right over to the conference hall, get your package and then but uh, I guess they didn't realize and I kind of forgot that I had lectures back to back. So my apologies for walking in late. Um, I am Lauren Goldenberg. I am the uh, owner and uh, director at the Athletic Conditioning Center in Ottawa. Uh, I have been working in, uh, in fitness since 1978. Uh, started at the very bottom, worked my way to the top. It's been... Uh, I've been working in a lot of different environments in professional hockey, professional football, youth athletics, uh, corporate fitness, and uh, I get to uh, I get to play. I get to play. I get to come here to uh, conferences like this and uh, just have a lot of fun. And uh, today we're going to be talking about strength ball training. How many of you guys uh, have the book? Nice. Okay, this is the first and only lecture I'm able to say you can buy the book if you don't have it at the, uh, at the idea booth in the exhibit hall. Uh, I was joking in my last lecture that uh, most of my friends uh, in the industry uh, always have uh, an opportunity to drive people to their websites, to buy this, to buy that. I really don't sell anything. I, I don't even sell the book, to be honest with you, but it's, it's the one product I can say you can pick up if you want to get my thoughts, ideas, and exercise progressions on and, and hope you'll enjoy it. It's, uh, it's been quite successful. We've, uh, we've sold over 70,000 copies uh, worldwide. It's been translated into about six different languages. Um, none of them that I would certainly understand. As a matter of fact, I had some emails from the editor from, uh, from Spain asking me questions and I couldn't understand his English, so I'm not sure how the book is going to, uh, going to go there. But it, uh, it's interesting how the whole thing came about because uh, if you would have talked to me back in high school, I never would have guessed that I'd, I would have uh, written a book because I failed grade 11 English and my English teacher told me that I was going to be, uh, be a failure and not get through university because I was a pain in her ass. But um, Suffice to say, and against uh, against uh, I guess the way I was in high school, I was able to kind of kind of make it. And the the whole gist of strength ball and the idea of working with the ball, I have to give credit where credit is due. Is Paul Check actually introduced me to the ball in the uh, in the early 1990s, and I uh, I was a strength coach with the Quebec Nordiques. National Hockey League, and uh, I heard about Paul. And and uh, how many people have seen Paul speak here? He's a little off the wall, he's kind of a crazy guy and uh, I went down and he kind of blew me away with, uh, with the ideas of the ball and rehab techniques, etc. And a a as a lot of you know, once you, once you get going with something, your mind kind of just flies, flies with it. Like you'll see things that we're, we're going to talk about today that, um, that you're going to have, um, you're going to do auxiliary exercises off of or create your own exercises. And actually at the end of the lecture, we're going to, we're, I want to try and see if you, you, you people want to share some of, some of the ideas and exercises that you've created as a result of, of being exposed to this uh, all the time. But the ball is just, it's really exploded. I mean, if you type in strength ball or stability ball, you're going to get over a, a million hits on the, uh, on the internet. So there are people all over the world buying the ball and utilizing them in, in strength training programs, whether it's professional athletes, general fitness enthusiasts, seniors. I mean, there's application for everything with the, uh, with the right pro progression. But I want to I make sure that everybody uh, understands there's a, uh, there's a lot of people who, who will tell you different things that the ball can do for you. And the one thing that it won't do is it won't strengthen your core if you, uh, if you end up eating it. Okay? Don't know how we got that pumped up, but they are not edible. Okay. What are we going to cover today? Okay, we're going to talk about science for and against the ball. Because if you're a guy like me, I read an awful lot of, uh, of, uh, of, of literature. Uh, journal of Strength Conditioning Research, Medicine, Science, Sports and Exercise, Sports Medicine Journal, and, and there's always uh, somebody who has more letters beside, beside their name who either will, you know, promote or refute the ball. And some, sometimes, you know, personal opinion gets in the way. So we're going we're gonna to talk about actually 10 different studies, and I hope I'm not going to put you to sleep, but I, I think it's important that you understand that there, there is a controversy out there whether these should be used at all. Okay, 
Uh, we'll talk about the core a little bit and define it from my perspective. We'll talk about biomechanics in the ball and, and how it can be used uh, productively in your programs. And, and most importantly, we're going to talk about exercise progressions. So I don't want anybody here leaving here trying to impress their clients with a new exercise you're going to see here when they're not ready for it. Okay? And we'll, do, we'll, we'll look at innovative exercises in and out of the book. So I've got, we've got a few, a few new exercises to introduce to you, and we're going to go over technique and progressions of, of, of a lot of the good ones that you'll be familiar with. Okay, so let's look at some of the studies. Okay, here's the first one. The effect of short-term Swiss ball training on core stability and running economy. They want to know, is a Swiss ball sport specific? Is a Swiss ball going to make you a better golfer, a runner, a football player, what have you? And what they found, this was in 2004, is that the ball helped improve core stability but was not sport specific. They're actually looking at runners in this study. They're looking at runners and they want to see if using the ball in their core program will make them have better uh, run times. Well, no, it's not going to make them have better run times. It's not, it's not specific. It's not specific. So if you want to be a better runner, you want to train, you want to increase your core strength because I think that's going to be important with regard to injury prevention, but it's not going to make you run a better marathon or it's not going to make you run a faster 100-meter uh, race. You've got to train the, the sport or activity that you're, that you're doing. The second one, effects of stability ball training on spinal stability in sedentary individuals. Okay. Um, they were looking at uh, a number of different exercises here. And they wanted to see if, it, uh, if, uh, if spinal stability could be, can be improved. And it improved spinal sp stability in sedentary people uh, in the side bridge and the uh, static back extension. So people who did this type of work were able to improve by 45 to 71 seconds in the side bridge uh, using stability ball work. And in the static back extension, they went from 149 to 194. So it was, uh, it it was positive because stability of the spine is very important. It's very, very important, okay, for us to be able to go to the next level to do uh, ground-based type movements and play sports effectively and, and just live day to day. Stability is important. Are you saying they can hold it for 45 to 71 seconds? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they went from 45 and they improved to 71 seconds and 149 to 194 um, in the back extension, okay. Muscle force activation under stable and unstable conditions. This was by David Baim in two, 2002. This was one of the first studies that actually did anything with, with stability ball training. And I wasn't really, I know, I know David, I've met him. I, I wasn't really happy with how he, how he did this study because all they were really doing is looking at whether there was more activation sitting on a ball, doing plantar flexion and a leg extension versus sitting on a chair and doing the same thing. And... Um, the stable conditions proved to have a higher, higher levels all the way around. Um, and he kind of summarized perhaps the greatest contribution of instability training may be to improve core stability rather than limb strength. In addition to the, uh, the preliminary purpose of the stability ball need not be significant strength gains. Okay, we'll talk about that later because I think it can be. But an attempt to prove balanced stability and proprioceptive capability. So it, it can enhance what we're doing or what we're trying to do. Okay. Okay, here's a study, another study by BAME. This one I liked it a little bit more. Um, the purpose of this study was to evaluate the effect of unstable uh, and unilateral resistance exercise on trunk muscle activation. Okay, so they're looking at one arm exercises and balance type exercises, uh, et cetera. And they looked at six different exercises, all right? And overall, the trunk stabilizer muscles are more highly activated by unstable rather than stable, okay? So that was kind of the opposite of his last study. Okay, in addition, resistance exercises with a single arm will cause greater activation of the contralateral side. So when we work the right side, we're doing, you know, right bench, standing bench presses or Swiss ball bench presses, the left side of the core has to work. So we're not twisting, twisting over. Okay, so we get static rotation strength development there. Okay. Here's one, increased deltoid and abdominal muscle activity during the Swiss ball bench press. Okay, they took 14 resistance trained subjects. They were doing uh, isolated uh, concentric, eccentric contractions with uh, a two second cadence at 60% of, uh, of uh, max. And uh, they found that the Swiss ball did not lead to increased activity for the prime movers of the exercise, um, which was the pectoralis and the, uh, and the triceps. But the deltoids and the abdominals had higher activation. 
So something else is going on. Something else is happening. The body is balancing out. There must be something positive about it. But the gist of this was that, you know, as far as strength is concerned, don't use the strength ball or the stability ball. Okay. Willardson in 07. This was a course stability training applications to sports conditioning programs by Willardson. And, uh, and I, got it. I got some issues with this guy, the way he had, uh, had written up this, uh, this review. Um, you know, Vera Garcia has positive things in his research to talk about stability and stability ball training and how it enhances strength. And Willardson goes on here, he says, a problem of this conclusion, okay, is that the level of muscle activation may not indicate the potential for force production. Okay, when performing resistance exercises on a Swiss ball, force production capability in the upper and lower extremities is significantly reduced. This may limit the potential of these exercises to benefit sports performance. So he's saying like, you know, if you're an athlete, don't use it. Okay, he goes on to say in his conclusion, he goes, the bottom line is that healthy athletes who already perform traditional resistance exercises, such as a deadlift, squat, power clean, push press, and Russian style rotation, are likely receiving uh, core stability training without the need for Swiss ball exercises. What, it, something jumped right out at me with that statement. What's that? Likely, likely is one, but there's something even more. Sufficient. Sufficient, no. No, the problem is all those exercises he's talking about are sagittal plane movements. Sagittal plane movements. So here's a guy who, you know, he just doesn't like stability ball training, okay? So, and if we look at sports, Okay, if we look at sports, we look at the movements involved, because football is a classic example, because all those exercises are classic football exercises. I, I saw a strength training program from the University of Texas for the football team. It was uh, bench press, military, uh, squats, power cleans, five sets of five. That was their program. That was their program. All sagittal plane stuff. Now, there's, I think the strength coach there was a former, uh, former uh, power lifter, so you know, personal preference always kind of impacts on, on what you're going to, what you're going to do. But look at this, uh, look at this video here. Look at the movement of the back. You look here. Look when he catches, so he's taking the ball, all right. The end zone is towards me. His hips are facing the sideline, and his shoulders are facing south. How much mobility do you think he needs in his hips and his spine to be successful here? And for those of you who don't recognize the guy, you guys recognize the guy who gave him the ball? Flutie. Flutie. Flutie, ex-Chicago Bear. Yeah, cutie Flutie. <laughs> okay, let, let's keep watching here. Let's keep watching here for a second. Okay, so he turns. Make some contact, look at his feet moving. More contact, and he's trying to get towards me, but he's going, he's gotta go in every different way, okay? So most contact sports are not all about working in a sagittal plane. So there goes his theory. Okay, this was an interesting study. This was 2008 by a guy named Nuzzo. I think he was doing his master's, uh, master's project under a guy named uh, Jeff McBride at Appalachian State. And Jeff McBride is a very pro-Olympic weightlifting type guy. And uh, this was trunk muscle activity during stability ball and free weight exercises. So they were really comparing um, the squat and deadlift versus a number of uh, stability ball exercises. And this is showing weight on there, but there was no weight. Okay, there was no weight. So it was just body weight versus high percentages of your RM. Okay, so they had, a, they said 100% of your squat and deadlift activates over 89% EMG of your back erectors. So that's good. Versus the Swiss ball Superman supine hip extension, side plank and back extension with a, which averaged 29 to 16% of MVC of your back extensors. So somebody might read that and say, oh, I'm not doing stability ball work anymore. It's ineffective. Why will we use it? It's right there. The numbers speak for themselves. He concluded 
Since stability ball exercises are at an intensity which will, which allow for the completion of a higher number of reps, they may not be appropriate for muscular hypertrophy of the back extensors. The role of stability ball exercises in strength conditioning programs is questioned. Then my book sales went down. <laughs> so I emailed Jeff McBride and I said, like, I could have told you the results of that study before you even went and did all the work. Why would you bother? Anybody would have guessed that using maximum weights in an exercise versus body weight would, in, would, it, would it increase strength? It's, it's kind of a, a, a natural thought, you know? So if I was his professor, I'd say, don't do that. Everybody knows the answer to that. Like, research something that you don't know the answer to. So I, so I emailed him that, and I also said, I said, well, why would you compare loaded versus unloaded? I said, why didn't you try that Superman the Superman exercise with like a, a five or a ten pound ankle weight and a ten pound dumbbell on each hand. I said because then your loading parameters, I mean it's still not even going to be close, but you're going to see ho much higher levels of, uh, of activation. And his response was, well, that's, you, you make a good point. <laughs> you make a good point. But, then, but this is how people get skewed. And I'm not a PhD, trust me. I have an honors degree in uh, physical education. I took, you know, a lot of kin courses. I did a lot of uh, professional development since I graduated. I am nowhere close to being a PhD. This guy's book smart. I think there's a difference between book smart and out in the field smart. Okay, like Paul Check doesn't have a degree, but he knows more than any PhD that I know. All right, because he's he's got that gift. He he reads an article and it's embedded in his mind forever. But he's, he's really efficient at, at taking research and applying it and making it work and really reading into it. That's why it's important to, to really look at these things. Now, interestingly enough, in that very same journal of, the, of uh, strength conditioning research, this guy, Goodman, had a study. He said, there's no difference in one RM strength and muscle activation during the barbell chest press on a stable and unstable um, surface. Okay, and I really, really like this study because it's the first study to reference strength ball training in, the, in its references. So I was kind of, kind of pumped about that. Um, what they did, they looked at range of motion. There's no difference in elbow range of motion during the movement. Uh, There's no difference in EMG or one RM strength. So here's a study that says if you bench press on a ball or you bench press on a, on a bench, you can increase your strength the same, same amount. The results do not support the notion that exercise on the ball are more effective than traditional bench presses. They're the same. They're the same. But the thing that we've always been trying to teach, myself and Peter, the thing we've always been trying to focus is not necessarily what's happening with, our, with the chest and shoulders, but when you're, when you're bench pressing on a ball, what's happening to your abdominals, what's happening to your glutes, what's happening to your hamstrings? They're working. They're working. They have to work. Then if you go unilaterally, they're working even to a higher level. And then if you put a weight vest over top of your hips, they're working to a higher level. So it becomes the bench press, which is a totally dysfunctional movement. I don't use it at all. The only time I ever use bench pressing movements is with uh, younger kids if we need them to hypertrophy a little bit. Or with my pro athletes, if they're getting ready for a combine, we'll start bench pressing three or four weeks before a combine, but I never use it typically in my, in my, in my training programs. Okay? But if you're dealing with clients who want to get stronger, they want to tone up, they want to lose weight, well, if you're activating chest, shoulders, tricep, abdominals, glutes, hamstrings in that bench press movement, where do you think you're going to burn more calories? Right. And you're going to develop similar kind of strength. Okay? Did you email him too? I didn't email him. I was just happy. Yeah, you know, he referenced my book, so it was, it was cool. <laughs> Okay, uh, not all instability training devices enhance muscle activation in highly resistance trained individuals. So this is a, a look at a study that, uh, like a lot of people say, oh, they, all, they only used untrained people. So, you know, it doesn't really work because untrained people, they're going to they're gonna grow and get stronger no matter what they do. So here we've got, like, athletes, weightlifters, football players who took part in this study. Okay, and they looked at the comparison of standing and squatting postures while balancing on a Dyna disc, a BOSU, a wobble board, and a Swiss ball. And uh, thank goodness they had greater activation on the Swiss ball compared to the Dyna disc and the BOSU balls. Not that they're bad, they're, you know, they're great tools, they, they, everything has their place. 
Um, highly resistant trained individuals might not obtain strength training adaptations from low loads, okay? Uh, as they may also not receive additional muscle activation or balance training effects from moderately unstable devices. So you gotta challenge them. You gotta challenge them. So just like a pro football player is gonna be able to, you know, I'm gonna have to challenge him more than I'm gonna, my 15 year old player, you know, to train. When you're doing balance and stability, you gotta take them to a higher level, okay? Okay, this is the last one. You guys all still with me? Okay, I think this is really important. Rather than just, just learning a whole bunch of exercises and the progressions, I think it's important that when you're talking to your clients or you're talking to colleagues or you're hearing that Schmo Willardson uh, bad mouth stability ball training, you can stand up and tell them what the real deal is. Okay, and I don't know Willardson, so I shouldn't call him a Schmo. Okay, muscular outputs during dynamic bench press under stable versus unstable loads. You think this has been researched to death, eh? The bench press exercise, okay? Bottom line is that, uh, that came out of this study was, uh, um, you know, stabilizing muscles is important in coordinated muscle performance. So when we're trying to work, make everything work together, that stability thing is, uh, is important, okay? So the bottom line with much of the research is that personal preference sometimes get in, gets in the middle of, um, of unbiased research. Unbiased research. Like I have never said that strength ball training is it. You know, in most of my programs, there's only one or two Swiss ball exercises. You know, and I usually use it in the, in the preparation phase. So if all these researchers would just get their uh, head out of there, you know what? I think the world of fitness and controversies would be, uh, would be uh, much better off. Okay. Let's get into this now. Why would anyone want to use a Swiss ball as a tool in a gym? That was Pete showing off. He was working on that. He knew we had the photo shoot for the book and he was working on that. I wouldn't even try it. Good. He's good. He's younger than me, though. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he's younger than me. Okay, so why would, you, why would anybody want to use it? Mobility, stability, balance, strength, coordination, flexibility, compliance, integration. Integration is re really the big key for me, is we get to bring everything together. Okay, you bring that all together, you have much more effective programs, your timing of your programs are much more efficient. All right, and in the end, I think your, your clients will be happier if you program it right and bring it all and tie it all together nicely. Okay, so let's look at the core, okay? The core can be defined as the area of the body between the sternum and just above the knee. Okay, this is what I think the core is. It's not just the abdominals, it's not just flexion, rotation, side flexion, all right? Our hip flexors are tied in, our glutes are tied in, our hamstrings are tied in. They all work together. You, we can't work in isolation. It has to be, be through, uh, through integration. <laughs> Particular emphasis can be placed on uh, the lumbar, the psoas, latissimus dorsi, okay? Lumbar being the spinal erectors, abdominals, obliques, quadratus lumborum, thoracolumbar fascia, that fascial envelope that ties it all together. That is important. Uh, the psoas, why is the psoas so important? Anybody know why the psoas is so important as part of our core? Hip flexion? Only muscle that links the leg to the back. I'm sorry? Only muscle that links your leg to the back. Exactly. Okay, it connects. It connects, well, it connects our lower body with our, with our, with our trunk. Okay? And how about latissimus dorsi? Latissimus dorsi. Anybody know why, why that's so important? If you, know, if you know the other answer, you know this answer. Well, it's a low back stabilizer, it's a global stabilizer of the spine, but it's what really connects our arms to our trunk also. So what happens here, all the forces, and we're gonna talk about this, forces through the, uh, through the lats, through the thoracolumbar fascia, through the glutes, it all has, a, has an impact. And some people think that, that the brain or the head should be included in the, uh, in the core also because it's really our brain that is, w is what drives all the muscle activation, that's the computer. Unless, of course, if your brain looks like this, then you're gonna have some issues and probably not be able to activate as, uh, as well as you would, uh, would have hoped. Okay, spinal stabilization. Definition and understanding from a clinical perspective. Clinical perspective. So we know a little bit, just in basic terms, what we're talking about. So, stabilization exercises trains a person to control posturally destabilizing forces. So if I come up and give you a bump, 
that's a posturally destabilizing force. And they include isometric uh, postural stabilization of a key area like your lumbopelvic junction, okay, during trunk, trunk extremity movements, and progressive functional activities that require control of your lumbopelvic area, like when you're squatting or split squatting. Okay, we have to be able, this is the area that we have to be able to control if we want to be more effective. Okay, they've been called uh, therapeutic because they do cause post-exercise muscle soreness without reproducing symptoms of pain for a lot of people if they're done properly. Okay. Okay, proper posture to enhance stability. The position that we place ourselves in during work or play uh, and training will dictate which tissues are loaded and which tissues are relaxed and not being, not being worked, okay? Muscles are active in order to perform functions other than uh, flexion and extension. Muscle contraction is necessary for maintaining stability of the, uh, of the spine. Now, if you look at the, uh, at the picture on the, uh, on, the le on the left here, whoops, I gotta use this here. Okay, if you look at this picture here, fully flexed spine versus neutral back spine. This is from, uh, from Stu McGill. The fully flexed spine is associated with what we call myoelectrical silence. We shut off the ability for those muscles to work by being in that position. And I know every single person in this room has seen people lift like that, doing bent over rows in that position. It kills me. It kills me. And that's why I usually only train it at my home or at the ACC. Because nobody will bother me and I won't have to watch anybody. Okay? Um, the neutral spine allows for muscular support provided by the shear supporting uh, ileus casalis and lumbar extensors, and it, it unloads all the interspinous ligaments. Okay, so when we get into, I'm sorry, when we get into this position, and it's hard to see here, but we get higher activation levels of all the muscles through the core. Well, as soon as we get in this position, when we get in this position, the muscle activation levels are very low. So when we try and do a reverse hyper on a bench, right, we want good posture. We need control of that pelvis. We need control of that, uh, of that lower back. Let's look at posterior oblique system of the spine, okay? Working latissimus dorsi in conjunction with the glutes, okay, will assist in restoring the body support system in a rehab setting or enhancing the core in a performance setting. Okay, so how do you develop these two areas in an integrated fashion? Okay, I'm going to show you I've got some really good examples of that exercise that I think you should utilize before you ever get on the ball. Okay? So this is, well that's, picture's not showing up very well. That's a guy holding a box and that's his lats and glutes. I'm not sure why it's not showing up, but anyways, this is Peter Twist's favorite, favorite line. Our body is a linked system. Everything is connected. We are connected. Our fingers are connected to our toes. There's a fascial system that connects everything. And that's why functional exercise is so important versus isolating type exercise. Okay? The position of the humerus will dictate tension on the thoracolumbar fascia. When I reach out, if I'm reaching out for something and pulling on something, all right, I'm stretching that lat. It's stretching on the thoracolumbar fascia. It's pulling on my, it's pulling on my glute. It all has an impact. Position of the pelvis dictates tension on thoracolumbar fascia. So if I'm in this position, but my pelvis is turned in, it's changing. It's changing that structure, okay? So I'm in, I'm in a good position here, but if, I, if my pelvis is rotated, posteriorly rotated, I'm shutting things down. If I rotate it right and I can get my positioning into neutral, then I'm protecting myself. I, I'm taking advantage of that, uh, of that natural corset that we have, okay, versus, say, putting on a weightlifting belt. Okay, so we get the summation of forces, lats, glutes, everything working together, okay. We have the bilateral pull of the latissimus dorsi has the effect of pulling on both sides of each vertebrae, so helping each segmental level, okay. Thoracolumbar fascia connects at every level down, down the, uh, our, lower, uh, our lower back, okay? Unilateral pull countered by glutes, obliques, and transverse abdominis. So there's a lot going on there. That's why a lot of my programs, if, if you ever pick up one of my programs, you'll always see, I bet you I'm a good 75 to 80 percent on muscles that you can't see versus the mirror muscles because stability, 
protection, prevention, all happens with what you can't see. I'd rather see an athlete with a really nice developed back, lower back, glutes and hamstrings, than with like a six pack, rounded shoulders, big pecs, you know, short biceps. It's not, uh, it's not attractive. Okay. So when can you start using a Swiss ball? Okay. When can you, s I started using, make my kids use it at a very young age. Okay, that's my daughter when she was like two and a half, three. My son's like five or six there, and, and they would do anything. Isaac, get on the ball, balance. I mean, they loved it. It's a lot of fun. Kids have a lot of fun. But there are issues with, uh, with kids and stability balls. And you need serious kids, all right? If you're going to introduce it to them, they need to be supervised because you see a lot of, a lot of stuff like this. Kids and self-abuse. I don't know where they got these exercises. Kids and so they have some balance issues. You know what are these kids thinking? And then people are using the ball as a weapon. It's just not right. These kids are running around, they're playing, their parents are upstairs, they don't know what's going on. Boom! Down he goes. Let's look at that in slow mo. That's like, this is really hard on the neck. <coughs> look at his neck. Oh, into extension. And down he goes. Anyways, you want to be careful with kids. Um, there was somebody uh, supposed to come with. Uh, with an audio cable, so we're going to be missing some audio. So I may take uh, take my microphone here and put it uh, put it next to this for uh, for the next couple of slides. Okay, some caution is necessary. Okay, progression progression is really important. Okay, even though the literature may indicate there's an increased use of core musculature, as with any exercise, there sh you, you have to be careful with which population you're using it for. Okay. Those kids that I just showed you need to be supervised, right? Never leave a kid alone with a Swiss ball, okay? Got to be careful with low back pain patients and rookies. You get that increase in core activation, but there's also an increase in spinal loads. And it's not a bad thing, like, I mean, we load our spine every day. We load our spine every day. It's important to understand that, like, high spinal loads is not bad, it's just how much you're loading it and what level you are will determine what's appropriate for you. Okay? Uh, McGill, Stuart McGill again. He thinks we should move from stable to unstable. Start off. Get their balance right. Get their strength up. Get their endurance up. Okay? Endurance before strength, especially, especially through, the, uh, through the core. And then we work towards, uh, work towards strength. So here are some exercises. These are some of the exercises that I like before we ever get into like high-end balance and stability ball training. The first one is a static hyperextension. So we just use a simple uh, st uh, static hyper bench, and we usually start people at 30 second, 30 second sets, and we progress every 15 seconds. I'm sorry, we progress by 15 seconds. And we try and work them up depending on what they're doing. Depending on what they're doing, if you just got uh, somebody who is recovering from back injuries, who, who is just a, like a construction worker or an office worker, we might take them to three minutes, build them up to three minutes in that position. If I've just got a hockey player or a football player where that kind of spinal endurance isn't necessary for their performance, we'll do lower levels. We'll do a minute and a half, we'll work to two minutes. Okay, but generally we start at 30 seconds and we, every uh, two or three workouts we'll add 15 seconds and build up for that type of static endurance. Okay, and then we work, we work on integrating the lats with the lower back. Lats with the lower back. So if you're, you know, most of these benches are, uh, are fairly portable, so you put it in front of a, uh, 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 an adjustable cable or a, or a lat uh, pull machine. And what we're doing here is we are now unloading the spinal erectors 
and the glutes. We're unloading those. They're working, but they're being unloaded, and we're loading the lats. We're loading the lats bilaterally, okay? And you would progress from this to unilateral, unilateral pulls, right? I want to start with unilateral first. We're going to start with bilateral, so we have e even progression and strength. And then we go to unilateral. Okay. Once we've got that tied in, then we go into a static hyperlat row. So what are we doing here? We are overloading the erectors, the glutes, and the hamstrings from a strength perspective. Okay? Because we've got that load in the hands. All right? And he's not ha hand handling heavy weights here. He's got like 20-pound dumbbells here. Okay, and we're kind of unloading the lats to reload, but we're making the lats and the low back work a little bit, uh, work, well, a lot higher, a lot higher, okay? So that's our integrated core. Now how about frontal and sagittal plane work, okay? Static side support or it's also been called a McGill side support or a plank or there's so many terms for these, uh, these exercises. And we start with, uh, with 60 to 90 seconds isometric static holds, okay? Two to three sets. And we progress to the point where they can do 12 to 15 slow tempo repetitions. <coughs> two to three seconds up, two to three seconds down. Getting the core to activate. We know that that exercise, according to McGill, has the lowest forces on the spine and highest activation levels on the abdominals. The two are married together. Highest activation of the abdominals with the lowest forces on the spine. Okay? Obviously you don't start with your feet, you can start from your knees depending on your uh, on your client. Okay? Then we progress, we progress to 12 to 15 slow reps of that same movement up and down. It's not, he's not just holding it now. The hips go down, the hips go up, the leg goes up. Okay? Right? 12 to 15 slow reps, then we move on. And we get the AD ductors integrated in this movement. Do not try and impress somebody with this exercise in their first workout to show them how weak they are. <laughs> you will tear their whole adductor complex and you'll lose your client. Okay? So we get in this position, what we're doing here, this is not static, this is dynamic. The hips are moving up and down. Okay? The hips are moving up and down here. Okay? And then, good old favorite, Sagittal plane plank, okay, on the stability ball, all right, lots of progressions uh, here, and again, we work 60 to 90, uh, 60 to 90 seconds, okay? Okay, so our progressions, methods of progressions, okay? So we can change the base of support, we could change the lever arm length, we can play with range of motion. There's so many variables to play with. And you got to think. You got to think when you're when you're planning these out. Just because it looks good in a book doesn't mean it's right for your client. You have to be able to react on the spot. You have your client doing an exercise, and all of a sudden, like, oh, I can't do that. They're just not making it. What is your next step to go backwards? You will impress them with that. If you can create success in your programs with how you alternate your exercises and modify them for your clients, you'll have uh, you'll have a client for life. Okay. Adding resistance, level of ball inflation, closing the eyes if you're working, more balance and stability. They're all things that you can, uh, you can play with. Okay, so let's look at a couple of progressions here. Okay, advanced supine hip extension. You are not going to introduce that to your client first time out. Okay, so how do you get there? What are the progressions? Okay. Supine hip extension number one. Arms out in a T, what does that do? Base of support. support. Alright. We get the ball, 
head back, and we're, and we're moving up and down, right? Hips are dropping and, and, and raising. And then we go to number two, we decrease the base of support. Arms come in. Arms come in, we decrease the base of support. Okay, number three, we continue the decrease in the base of support, make more balance challenges, and then the arms go over top. So we're taking more, more of the body off the ground. Okay, number four, number, oops, sorry about that. Number four, <laughs> all right, we use a bigger ball. We've increased the range of motion with the bigger ball, right? So we bring the hands back down. So we go back a level on one point, but then we go up a level on another point, okay? And there, there are tons, tons more progressions here, right? What are some other things we can do? Roll it in and out. You can roll it in and out and change, change the lever that way. You can put a weight vest over their hips. Weight vest over their hips. And you can play with more ball sizes at lower levels if they're really having problems. Right? And once you've done all that, then you can, you can get them into something like, like this. Okay? So what would be the progression let me challenge you. What would be the progression if you were at number four? If you're at number four, you're, you're, oops, you're here, and you want to go to single leg, unilateral, and he can't do it. He can't, he can't get up and down. What are you going to do? The other, the, number four is easy, but number five is too hard. What are you going to do? It could be a smaller ball. Put his arms out might help. You could shorten a lever, or you could do eccentric only, because he's not strong enough to concentrically lift, right? So he's going to lift with both legs, raise one hip, lower eccentrically in four to six seconds, foot back down, raise with both. Okay? Does anybody want to demo demonstrate it for me? No. Isn't this supposed to be, this is supposed to be an act of let? I, I can't do it. I, I'm the speaker. I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm not, like I'm 47 and I'm not warmed up. Like, <laughs> yeah. Here we go. You want me on the floor? On the floor. On the floor. So I just want to make sure because I think, I think visually it's, uh, it's, it's better for everybody to, to see this, okay? So we're going to raise your hips, keep your head back, raise up with both legs. One leg comes up. Now lower yourself with one leg, all the way down, nice and easy. Leg back down, up. Now lower yourself with the other leg. And back down, right, again. Back down, there we go. Okay, so what that does, if you were in my fiber training course, you'd understand the importance of the eccentric contraction. We're stronger with eccentric contractions, and we can use that, we can use that fundamental uh, alteration of the repetition to, uh, to, to train us to get stronger unilaterally to allow us to do it concentrically and eccentric with, with one leg, okay? Any questions about that? Okay. Okay, push-up progressions. Here's the most simple exercise that it's just Mm, like it's incredible how many people just kill this exercise. It's so easy. Here's a simple Swiss ball push-up from the very beginning, from the knees, right? That would be the first progression. That would be the first progression. And this is actually a little bit easier than doing it on the floor because on the floor you've got more load because your load is right over your chest and shoulders. You're kind of unloading your shoulders this way, okay? And you got a little bit of instability there. So you might you know, if, they, if they're really, really weak, you might start them. Start them at something like this. Okay. Then we go to the fully extended push-up. Okay, from the toes. Then we've got raised feet. So now we're transferring more load. Transferring more load to the chest and shoulders. Okay, then we got unilateral foot position. Okay, so we're, act, we're asking, not only are we, we've got some balance going on there, but I'm asking the glutes to work, right? 
That right glute is working, okay? And then we go with dual instability. Oops. Dual instability. Okay, now the ball is against the wall. I've never seen anybody do this with two balls. Like, I mean, first of all, you try getting on it yourself. It's not going to happen. But you can do it if you've got the ball up against the wall. So it's kind of neat. Or you can take the safer uh, mode and, you know, put a BOSU or an extreme balance board under your feet, which is something that we, uh, we do often. Okay, here's, uh, here's one of these exercises that I thought I created, and then in some old uh, strength training rowing books, I saw variations of it, so I was really disappointed, and this is how, like, everybody in fitness, I think we all think the same, like, one day I was uh, in the backyard with my kids playing on their swing set, and he had these, you know, the little rings hanging from chains, and I was just, like, you know, I was playing with my kid, and we were hanging outside in the back, and I, I'm thinking, geez, this would be kind of neat to do pull-ups on if you could do pull-ups on it before all these like new fangled doodads came out from perform better and what have you for uh, for doing chin-ups like that like the gymnastic rings and I, I kind of went down I had my feet extended and I thought yeah 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 let's put a ball under my feet I thought that's it it's Goldie's supine pull-up anyways little did I know some older guys had already uh, already uh, already done it but I think that this this exercise is like the uh, it's the king of, I mean, it's the upper body that's working here as a prime mover, but it's the whole body that really has to work, okay? So it's almost as effective as a, as a squat in developing strength for the backside, okay? As, a, as effective as a squat is for developing leg strength, this is, can be as effective at developing strength through the back of the shoulders. We tie in the neck extensors, we tie in thoracic extensors, we tie in lumbar extensors, hip extensors, hamstrings, okay? The whole body has to work here, okay? So again, we you know, begin with a smaller ball, and we'll have the ball closer to the knees for those people who can't do it. I can take almost anybody and do this exercises if we move the ball, right, if we move the ball this way and we shorten this lever, all right, we can get, I can get anybody to do this exercise just by playing with that and then playing with the height of the ball. It doesn't, well, it, it, you know, you can, you, can switch, you can switch it up. Definitely, uh, definitely switch it up. But you want to, with your hand spacing, you want to make sure that when you're pulling, you, you've got to have a 90 degree angle here. Okay, if you're pulling, you're inside, you're going to end up using more, more forearms than, than posterior delts. Okay? So you can pull, if you go underhanded and you keep your elbows in tight, you'll work some posterior delt more lat. If you go outside and your arm is abducted, then you can work more uh, uh, posterior delt and uh, rhomboid. Throughout the uh, throughout the back, so it's 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 a it's a very difficult exercise. The the, the biggest thing you want to be careful of with your clients is they're always going to forward flex the neck. They have got to keep their neck, ear, shoulder, hip, knee, one straight line. Okay. There's no progression for this. Absolutely no progression for this. You see a lot of clowns, like Paul used to do it. Watch me do hand cleans on a Swiss ball. Not, uh, not cool. Not cool at all. And it's, it, it, it's stuff like this that, that gives the ball a bad name, that maybe makes those PhD guys uh, poo-poo on, uh, on the Swiss ball and their research projects. Um, basically, I think the ball just, you know, that kind of stuff should be left for the, uh, left for the circus animals. It's a little bit more appropriate. He would get a lot more hurt than, than the elephant falling off that thing. Okay, you can't equate sports training with movement in a linear position. Okay, sports, general movements of the body will impose a perturbation of the body's equilibrium. Okay, give you a little push, give you a little shove. That's a perturbation, okay, because we are linked. Everything is linked. I hit you in the shoulder, everything is going to activate. If I throw off your equilibrium, okay? These perturbations increase when movement is performed under load. Under load, okay? So let's look at uh, stability and perturbations. I'm going to need, uh, I need a fitness model to come up and, uh, and help me here. Who wants, uh, who wants to come up? You want to come up? Come on up. 
Okay, so let's look at the first one here, uh, supine hip extension with a ball squeeze. Why don't you come, come on up here, go, uh, actually we'll go uh, tabletop on that, sitting on your back. Yep, yeah, I want a bridge and uh, I will use this ball. Okay, so I'm going to ask her, uh, g give it a hug, hug the ball. Hug it like it's your, like it's your oh. husband or boyfriend and you, oh, okay. you miss them. <laughs> your dog, your dog, there you go. <laughs> That's why there's so many single people in the world. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, okay, so stability and perturbation. So what would we do here? There's a, there's a number of different progressions and things that we would do. We would start with ball slap. So I'm going to, I'm sorry, what's your name? Pally. Pally. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smack the ball. And I want Pally to, I want her to hold her position. So if I, she doesn't know where I'm going to smack it, but she has to work to do that. Okay? So this is, if I get, get it really going, I mean, she's going to, doesn't know where it's coming from, and <laughs> she's really, stay there, we're going to keep going. She, it, it, it's tough because when you fall off a curb, when you're playing uh, football and you're looking at the ball and the safety's coming this way and he smacks you, I'm not saying this is going to protect you and you have to do this, but all I'm saying is it, it creates an ability of the nervous system to be able to turn on and react, okay? Turn on and react. So we might start with things before we got there. We might do some uh, more strength type movement. So I might just say, okay, pal, you just hold it. Don't get out of your position and I'm going to try and move her. I'll move her this way, I'll move her this way, I'll move her this way, and we'll do sets of this type of movement for anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds. So it's a strength type movement here. She's got to keep controlling, and I may just keep it there in place, when you come back this way, and I, like, I don't know which way I'm going. I'm just going, I'm trying to find the path of least resistance, and she's pretty good. She's reacting fairly well to that. Now, once she's done that, if I start smacking the ball, like now her nervous system is turned on. She's kind of fired up. So if I start hitting her, she's going to be more effective. Okay? All right. So this isn't, thank you oh. very much. That was excellent. So this isn't, this is an exercise. This is like, this is part of fitness. This isn't just for a football player or a rugby player or a hockey player. Or, I mean, this is the ability to, to, for your body to handle something it doesn't know about. I mean, it's, it's, how many people have had a back injury here? Everybody put their hands up. Anybody who's not put their hands up, you know you're lying, okay? Like, I mean, you've ever been debilitated by a back injury? People don't know what happens. I, I remember about three years ago, I was uh, playing in a touch football game. And I remember going up for a ball, like just jumping up for the ball to try and knock a ball down. And I came down, I just thought, oh, something's not right there. Like I felt my psoas just cramp right up. And there's like three plays left in the game. I finish it up, I get home, and I'm, you know, I get out of my car, I'm walking. And the, the more I walk, the lower I'm starting to, to walk. I don't know, like I just played a whole football game. I was fine until that last play. And I didn't come down wrong. Anyways, I, my back was really getting sore. Popped a couple of ibuprofens. It was getting sore. It was cramping up. It was spazzing up. And I just said, I'm going to go in the pool. Like I, my kids were in the pool. I, I jumped in the pool, and all of a sudden, it was gone. Anybody know why it was gone? Gravity. Gravity. I was totally unloaded. Anyways, I couldn't stay in the pool all day. Got out of the pool, dried off, and I started walking up the stairs to go to my bedroom. And all of a sudden, as I got to the first landing, I just went down. And I stayed there for almost two days. The pain was incredible. Okay, so I guess, and I really did stay there for two days. I had a jar to go to the bathroom. It was not good. Okay. What's that? I couldn't get up. It was, it was incredible. I had two, two, it was a day and a half of muscle relaxants. But on the second day, no, no, I had, I had an acupuncture guy come over, I had a soft tissue guy come over, like you couldn't, it was just, anyways. So things happen to the back that we don't know why it happens, like it's like a segmental level thing. It's just the way, for whatever reason, something happened when I went for that ball and it just caused everything to just spasm up, 
right? So I'm not saying this is going to prevent that, but I'm saying it's a, it's a different mode of training. It's a, it's a way of uh, integrating your nervous system uh, in a different way because we're not used to it. Typical nervous system training, we look at plyometrics, we took a look at speed training, Olympic style lifting. Like this is, is similar. This could be, this is very uh, online with, with a nervous system type training, perturbations, okay? The, the, the progression from that, and we go to a closed chain where we can do the same thing, um, same thing with ball slaps and movements, etc. We can have a, we can have a little war. You can play games with your uh, with if you if you're dealing with athletes. As you can see here, I'm in a much better anatomical position than uh, than Pete, and uh, was pretty sure I was going to be able to take him down on uh, on this move. But you'll notice he's got a little bit of posterior rotation in his hips here, just a bit, right? But he feels okay. He's a hockey guy. Pete's more of a hockey, like he played hockey, I played football, and you can see how I'm ready, like, you know, a football guy is always ready to, to make contact, the hips are back, chest and shoulders are forward, because that's our strongest position, so it's funny, just inherently, how what we've done kind of stays with us as we're, uh, as we, uh, as we kind of grow older, and, and with training it comes out. So this isn't just a core exercise, I mean, there's obviously some core working here, but it's also, it's a, it's, a, it's a great exercise for your whole ankle knee complex. Okay, when you're play, if you're playing sports, if you're playing soccer, if you're playing football, if you're playing rugby, if you're just, you know, if you're just fooling around with your kids outside, everybody's doing lateral movements, you know. My, my, my 10 year old daughter juked my 13 year old son playing football in the back. This exact type of movement, foot plant to the outside and out, out you go. So it's not just something that an athlete would do, this is something that everybody does even in play. Even in play, so when you go down and you're like, oh my ankle, it's important that these type of perturbations and stability gets integrated. Okay, so let's look at core programs and strength training, okay? How many exercises for the abdominals are necessary when designing strength training programs? Anybody want to take a shot? No? Okay. Generally, when I do my programs, we usually do in like a kind of an upper body core and a lower body core split. And my core is uh, a, sag a sagittal plane one day and uh, uh, transverse plane and frontal plane the other day. And it's not 15 exercises, but you see some of the things on the internet and what people are doing, and it's, it's crazy. Here is an example. Okay, I don't, I'm not even gonna say the website I got it, got it off of. For 15 minutes, six days a week after you do your free weightlifting programs, do these abdominal exercises. They are meant to be supersetted, which means no rest in between. Go 15 minutes straight. 15 minutes straight. Is it strengthening or is it aerobic? Okay. And the rectus, for those who were in my last lecture, is what, fast twitch or slow twitch? Fast. Fast twitch. So we're asking a fast twitch muscle to be aerobic. Now I know this seems especially difficult for beginners, but exercises, these exercises are so simple, they allow you to do cheat a little bit to help you gain that strength you need. For $29.95, click here and you can get these exercises, rock hard abs, free weight training program, bicycle exercises, captain's chair raises, vertical crunches, side bridges, okay? See, it's very, it's very simple routine, just keep on rotating exercise until failure or the 15 minutes are up. Okay, now in previous posts, I've said that one of the best exercises for the abs is cardio. And therefore, it must be included in all my free weight routines. See, this is the kind of thing I really need to do. Because this guy, I'm sure he makes more money than me. He's got that website with that little button. Click here, give me your credit card. That's what I need. Okay, let's look at functionally training the abdominals in a smart, smart environment with the right kind of tools here. Okay. Now this one's kind of cool. Okay, so prime bridge with a cross body pass. It's kind of like an advanced progression from the Russian twist. Okay, 
Eccentric work. Convert to concentric work. I want you to look at his hips. How many people have you seen doing Russian twists with the hips just dropping? The hips have to stay horizontal to the ground. They have to. You want to use your, you were working transverse plane here in a supine position. So if the hips drop, you're not working it effectively. And you have to be a really good thrower. Supine rotator scissors. Okay, here we're tying in those AD ductors. AD ductors and the abdominals. Begin by raising the ball to a 45 degree angle to your hips. Squeeze the ball and rotate at your hips so that one foot moves over the other. You really got to squeeze the ball. You'll find sometimes when you're when you're while you're doing this, you're, you're you lose your position if you're not squeezing it tight enough. And we're doing that, 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 that press into the hands. We want to make sure that the spine stays neutral. If you're not strong enough here, you'll get that too much of a lordotic curve. You've got to maintain that, that contact. So if you can't put your hands here also, you can also put like, a, like an, air, an air X pad or, or a, 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 a sit fit, just something small underneath so you can have something to, to, uh, to squeeze against to activate the abs. Okay, because you've got an eccentric load on that lower lumbar as a, as a result of your arms being up in the up in the air. So it's really good for stability of the uh, of that lumbopelvic junction. Okay, same one. Core rotation, Goldie's lateral static helicopter. People laugh when they see my name up there because it's the only way I'm going to get famous. There's that and there's Goldie's uh, leg hip blaster. And I've done that because I, I did create these exercises, or I think I did. And, uh, you know, my buddy's name is Twist. He's got his name involved in more exercise names than anything. So I had to, I had to make sure my name, even though it's like first on the book, I had to make sure it was like in the book somewhere. So we'll call it Goldie's. Okay, so this one's kind of a, this one's a, a, a cool, uh, cool movement. So this would be a, pro a progression from, say, the, the lateral crunch move, right, which is a frontal plane move. Look where I'm looking at that hand, my left hand. I'm just keeping my eyes on that left hand. That allows more effective rotation through my spine as I, uh, as I go through the range of motion. To make this exercise more challenging, hold two to five pound dumbbells in each hand. So we get kind of, kind of like a static, static work through the frontal plane and lots of rotation. Okay, you're not going to use two heavy dumbbells. You want to keep it fairly light, all right? Because you've got big long levers out there also. Too, too, too heavy a dumbbell, you're going to put a lot, a lot more load on your, uh, on your shoulders. Right here. Okay. Back to back stop and goes. Okay. So what's happening here is we move concentrically around. We fake the pass in behind and come back. All right, we're really making use of that stretch reflex in a transverse plane. To your right. Stop and rotate to your left, passing the ball to your partner. Repeat this movement pattern. Be sure to move your feet together with your knees bent throughout the movement. So our progressions here, obviously, heavier balls, heavier balls, and we change the lever arm. We change the lever arm by holding the, ar the ball out farther away from our body to create more torque through our spine. Okay? It's harder than it looks. In, uh, God, I want to say 
mid 1990s Pete and I were doing an NSCA presentation together and he's uh, like you know he, he had his part and I had my part I had my practically at his practical he's like uh, Goldie I need you to help me up on stage I'm like okay and this was the exercise and uh, he showed it to me like you know, an hour, like half hour before we're ready to go up, and I'm like, uh, and I could not get it. I screwed up every single repetition. I can remember it was fake in the back and there in the front, or fake in the front and give it in the back, and it was, uh, it was embarrassing. And it was, it was a big, it was developing athleticism. We had over a thousand people in the audience, and it was, uh, yeah, it was not, uh, it was not good. Good exercise, bad fitness guy. <laughs> okay. All right, here's, a, here's another good one if you don't have anybody to train with. All right. Missing ball standing twist against the wall. And you don't want to, you see, you can hear the ball hitting the wall, but we're not looking for the ball to smack against the wall. What we're, what we're really looking for here is, is for you to almost stop just as you get into the wall and, and a quick change of direction. So we go from eccentric to concentric very quickly, very explosively. So this is how we increase the range of motion, the ability to twist and torque. So you can do this with your clients because a lot of clients who are, are, have, have poor rotation in their spine, okay, you can use this as a tool to increase mobility Forget about the speed component, use the mobility component, move slowly so they can learn how to rotate, stabilize their hips and rotate their, uh, their spine because most rotation, right, most rotation is happening up top so they're going to they're gonna do this and we want to get some rotation. We're limited down low but we're going to get some rotation down low to work a little bit of mobility there, okay? Okay, let's look at hips and legs. Hips and legs, the poor man's glute ham rollout. It's called poor man because there's no real big steel equipment necessary. Now just looking at this, you might think it's, a, it's an ab rollout. Okay, look at my hamstrings as I start to come up. Glute, ham, gastroc. Now pull yourself back up to the starting position. Continue exerting pressure with your ankles into your partner's hands. So the ball, what we're doing is we're using the ball to assist us in training the hamstrings and glutes as a hip extensor integrated with knee flexion. Okay? Integrated with knee flexion versus, say, just a simple hip extension, knee flexion on its own. Everything is tied in together, right? All my global stabilizers there are working to keep my lumbopelvic junction tight, and then we're flexing at the knee at the same time. Okay? Very advanced exercise. Very advanced exercise. So what would you do here if you had somebody who just couldn't do it but needs that kind of work? Nope. Nope. Same example. I'll use the same example as a hip extension. Eccentric. Eccentric. Anybody want to try it? <laughs> Peer pressure. Okay. Let's use this. Let's use a smaller ball. Okay. And this this is a really 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 tough exercise. Okay, so why don't you, uh, why don't you, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, sure, go down that way. I'm going to hold on to his knees, okay, so he's going to, he's going to start in this position here, and all he's going to do, he's going to, he's going to roll out, okay, go ahead, keep the cord tight in this position. Now, just walk it back with your hands, okay, roll it out again. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're working, we're loading him eccentrically. Now I'm sure, pretty sure he's a 
fairly well-developed guy. I'm probably pretty sure he could probably do a glute ham on his own. But this is a positive way to introduce that to him. Okay, that in itself is an advanced exercise. Like you wouldn't, don't be taking your 45 year old housewife who's just starting out in a strength training program to do this. This is somebody who you really want to challenge for their, uh, w for their hamstring and, and, and back development. And you progress there. You would do sets of like, five to seven repetitions. When you're doing just eccentric only work, thank you very much. When you're doing just eccentric only work, you're not doing high repetition work because that is a, that's a heavy load. That is a very heavy load, so we keep the repetitions low, five to seven. You may, if you, you know, if you only get three or four, then you're getting three or four. And you'll do three or four sets of that, okay? And progress to the point where he can move concentrically, okay? Okay, hips and legs, overhead lateral squat. This is with the stability ball. So we're doing kind of, uh, squatting side to side, we're moving side to side this way with the ball overhead so we're really working uh, mobility through our spine to be able to hold the ball overhead all right as we move side to side and the ball you can only get so heavy with the ball right at some point with our athletes anyways we like to take them to a to a higher level so we'll, we'll move it to an overhead an overhead squat side to side. So now we're working really good strength in the frontal plane. All right, he's getting some sagittal plane loading in his knees, but everything is working. We're tying in. We're tying in his neck. We're tying in thoracic. We're tying in lumbar. All right, we're tying in the hips. Okay. And I like my athletes to be able to get in that position. In my next lecture, for those who are going, we're going to talk a lot about working overhead. And I'm going to talk about heavy weights. He's not really, live, it looks like a heavy weight. Those are Olympic weights. It's, it's only, uh, he's got like 95 pounds overhead. You know, heavy for, heavy for somebody just starting out, but for, for an athlete, it's, it's not heavy. And we never, I never get uh, real heavy and stuff in exercises like this. Okay. Okay, hip and legs. O'Brien's hip extension with static hip of hip flexion. I need another, uh, need another, uh, another uh, fitness model. I'm already doing it, so I need somebody that really helped me in 3D. Do we want to come up? Okay. O'Brien, for those of you who are uh, wondering, Andy O'Brien is a good buddy of mine. He uh, took over for me uh, with the Florida Panthers. He, he was a strength coach of the Florida Panthers up until uh, about uh, a month ago, and he's taking a job in Calgary. And uh, he showed me this as, a, as one of his favorite exercises for helping develop stability through the hips. So we're going to get down in that, in that position. Here, you know what? I'm going to let you face the... Uh, so I can see. So you can see. Okay, so one leg is, leg is extended, one knee is pushed into the ball with the knee pretty well at a, at, a, at, a, at a 90 degree angle, and she's driving that knee, she's driving her outside knee here into the ball fairly hard, okay, fairly hard. So that is causing uh, flexion on her right side, and what she's going to do then is she's going to extend this hip, so she's got flexion on the front right, she's going to get extension on the left back. <laughs> and, and do what? Oh, oh, sorry, hold on a second. <laughs> keep pushing, keep pushing. You, now, now keep pushing your knee into it, okay. but you use your, use your foot now. Okay. okay, that was just, I'm sorry, that was just getting into the position. Okay, so flexion on the right, on the front, hip extension on the, uh, on, on the back. Okay, so she'll, you'll come down, you'll, you'll, your hip will come down, all the way up. Down, you're looking that she's she's got good posture here. She's not hyper uh, hyper extending in, in her lower back. She's getting a good contraction in her in her glute. Keep going. If uh, we want to progress this, we might add an ankle weight here, right? Or I could do some manual resistance with her and really get that glute to fire. Come on up. Don't forget to keep. I'm going to keep flexing here, so you, you've let that go. You got to keep that. So what this is what this is doing? What this is doing? We're kind of integrating the hips. We're integrating the front of the hip with, with the back of the hip. So we're, we're not getting any rotation in the hips as she's, uh, as she's doing that. So you would perform sets on the right side and you would perform sets on the left side for your one set. Okay, so you would switch legs because now this side is fatigued but the front side is not so she can go 
right to the right to the left front and and to the uh, to the right back. Okay. Ac Um, would we deflate that ball? Your picture, you look like you're yeah, she's she's a little she's a little high, not too much, but she she is she's a little high, for sure. Okay, but great exercise for teaching the uh, the spine how to stabilize itself. Okay, low level, like it's an exercise like any level any level person could do. Thanks, Samantha. You're welcome. Okay. Okay, shoulders and upper back. Okay, prone front raise, lateral fly. So it's a lot of shoulder work here, a lot of shoulder work, but a lot of rotation, static rotation through the core, through the core. A little coordination, you know, getting, getting people used to. It's up and out, so you're just alternating. So you're basically working backside on one side of the shoulder and then anterior delt on the on the opposite side. Now the core is really firing up. Now you notice the, uh, the the weights on the floor there. We usually do that against the wall. In this particular instance, we didn't have a wall that we were able to set up on to get the shot that uh, that we wanted. But you, you, you have to have your feet, you have to be braced, there's no way. Now, if you've got a client with low back pain, you're not going to do it on the ball. You're not going to do it on the ball, because you're really tying everything up here. Like your, your erectors are working, thoracic extensions are working. It's a good thing, but if they've got low back pain, you can do this, something like this, either, um, uh, well, basically on an incline bench. You have them straddle an incline bench, and that would be the progression that you uh, that you would use, okay. Okay, shoulders and upper back, supine lap pull and delt raise. This is a good one for overhead mobility and extension through the arms. Okay, most people you should be able to get your arm straight up in the air, bicep to the ear. God created us that way. Okay? So if you're tight, like gravity's going to help you get there. Be careful with the loads. Got to start off nice. This is more of a, it's, a, it's more of a strength load for the shoulder, anterior the shoulder, and more a flexibility load for the, uh, for the lat. Okay? You got to be careful with the loading because when you're in this position and you're coming up, all right, you're putting some some stress on that uh, on that uh, long head of your uh, bicep tendon. Okay, long head of your bicep tendon. If you're if you're too heavy here. Okay. No, no, no. You want to be careful on the pre-stretch. Of, of this one, but notice the weight vest that uh, that Pete threw on me. So we were talking about you know getting everything to work together. So I'm just loading up my, my hip extensors a little bit more. So, and you would do that type of uh, strategy. You would use that type of strategy, especially when you're doing a, a full body routine, right? If I'm doing my legs and core the next day, you know, tiring, my, tiring out my, my glutes and hammies the day before, even though it's sub-maximally, still not a good thing, okay? So that is more of a technique that you want to use when you're doing full body, uh, full body programming. Okay, so here are some uh, Swiss ball, med ball exercises that are not in the book. Not in the book. Okay, this is an offset single arm dumbbell bench press. There's two offsets here. We've got two offsets. The first offset is obviously the weight on one side. The second offset, you can see where his body is on the ball. He is not centrally located on the ball. So he's getting a lot more core work here. See where, see where his head is? It's not in the book because you don't like it? This is not in the book because I thought about it after the book got published. 
Okay. This is this. Like I like this exercise. I like this exercise. Yeah, it's an advance. So you would go from, right? Here's your progression: bilateral dumbbell bench presses, and maybe you'll throw a weight vest on if you're doing the whole body thing. Then you go to unilateral bench pressing, and then you might go, uh, you might go to something like this. But instead of having the head, right? Instead of having the head here, maybe the head is here, and you work your way out. You work your way to that real true offset. Okay? Then you can also do the presses with, with one leg extended, right? Yeah. You can. Okay. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It'd be really impressed if you could do it with the right leg. <laughs> really impressed. Okay. Oh yeah, he can do everything. He's got the good name, he's got the long Hollywood hair. <laughs> um, okay, reverse rollouts. We're all familiar with, with, with rollouts for the abs. All right, here's a reverse rollout. Okay, reverse rollout. Where the rollouts, where the, where the ball's underneath the elbows, you'll feel a little bit more, I think everybody will agree, you, the, the tension is a little bit more upper abs off the, uh, off the ribs and the sternum. This is a little bit more lower abs because we're, we're extending out our knees and we're extending out our hips as we, uh, we move out. So, you know, I haven't put an EMG on it and said, this is lower abs, I'm just going by what I feel. Anyways, one way or the other, it's activating your abdominals. Okay, so you just want to be careful when you go out. You want to certainly be careful right here. Okay, he's pretty good. He's going into a bit of lordosis, but the goal here, your eventual goal is to get to the point where your knees and your hips and your shoulders line, right, without going into lordosis. So maybe you're doing shorter range reverse rollouts to get there. Okay, yes. Well, see, you're going to come up after and show us that. <laughs> okay, good I that is a good idea. I haven't tried it, but we're going to try it. Okay, what do we got next? Okay, uh, RDL, Romanian deadlift med ball explosion. Because there's not a lot of ways of working the hamstrings. Hamstrings are so important. Stability for your spine, strengthen your back. Uh, if you're an athlete, change the direction, protecting the knee. And classically, we train this like, with, with heavy load and, and, uh, and slow type movement. So, so if you're familiar with a Romanian deadlift, for those of you who aren't familiar with a Romanian deadlift, if you're holding a, holding a, holding a, a weight here, it's like your classical deadlift where you're you know, squatting up and down full range, but instead of the knees bending, it's the hips that are moving. So the hips just move straight back, right? The weight shifts to my uh, heels and I load to the point where my back stays flat and then I, I come up, but all the movement is from my hip. It's pivoting around my hip. So with a med ball, we can get a little bit more explosive, drive, and explode forward. So we're all, of, all the movement, all the force is coming off the hip. So we're doing it against the wall here. If you're with a client and you're outside with the medicine ball, you can do it outside and throw the ball back and forth to each other. But the, the key here is that you're not, like the knees kind of bend to about 10 degrees and they lock in that position and then we, we fire forward. Okay, glued ham raise. Glued ham raise. We saw the poor man's glued ham, ham raise. This is, this is a poor man's glued ham raise. This one you, can, you can almost do it on your own here. Look at the feet. The feet are, are, are positioned in. It's all movement about the hips with some knee, a little bit of knee flexion here. Now you'll notice the ball is raised up on a, on a weight plate, and we're, we've done that. We've done that specifically because the ball, depending on your surface, the ball will roll out on you. So by doing that, it provides a little stickier surface so the ball's not going to roll out. So we're just using the ball as a, as a pivot point. That's a 55 centimeter ball. That is. You don't want it coming all the way up to the hip, though, right? Uh, 
No, you mean like you're, you know, sit on the ball and you're parallel to the ground, that kind of thing? No, no. That rule only applies with like seated exercises if you're using the ball as a, as like an office chair. But for exercises, there's so much variation uh, with it, it would, uh, that would change. So the other thing that's happening here is his toes are really pressing into the wall. Okay, yes? So is he pushing his thighs more into the ball or is he... Yes, he is, he is pushing his thighs into the ball. Into the ball, okay. Okay, now we got a side crunch helicopter. So we're kind of combining a, a couple different movements here. So we rotate, bend the elbow, over, up, rotate, over. So we get some dynamic frontal plane work, dynamic frontal plane work with rotation. Okay, same thing, we can add a weight vest on the, over the chest and shoulders. We can add dumbbells in the hands. Dumbbells in the hands. Okay. Okay. Here's a good explosive strength move. Okay, med ball, crossover, step up with a twist. So we're moving that ball hard and fast. And we're driving the legs. We're getting rotation through the leg. We're getting rotation through the leg as we come up because we're starting here. Driving the leg down, rotating as we come across and then back down. And where we get the rotation is the ball comes up. So we're driving here, we're already rotated, we've got to keep it, keep it tall so we have the ball offsetting this rotation so we get good range of motion and we use that explosion also to help, help get us up. But you've got to drive the, leg, uh, drive the leg coming down. Okay? Any questions on that? So your progression here would, your progression here would obviously be, well, a lower one and also maybe just to to do it without a ball or just to, you know, strengthen the legs. Because people who are used to doing step ups, not too many people are used to move, doing a step up combined with, a, set, with a, a frontal plane movement and rotation through the hips. And I'll tell you, your clients, the first time they do this, forget about the ball, if they just try doing that crossover step up, they're going to feel their glutes on fire, on fire the next day. Okay, you had a, you had a question? I, I have a question about the, excuse me, the Romanian deadlift. Yep. A friend of mine who I train, her husband is a kinesiologist, chiropractor, and he said he has more clients come to him with low back issues. He's so against the, the deadlift, I don't even do that with her. And she does have low back stuff, but I never, I never load her down. I always do really light weights, and I watch her posture and everything. So what? Well, to, to, well, to me, if they if they're getting injuries, they're getting injuries in their lower back because they can't stabilize their low back. Remember that picture early on? I showed McGill's picture. When there's any kind of flexion. If you get flexion like that, you start shutting off muscles. The back has to be neutral. The has, back has to be neutral. If it's, out of the, if it's staying in this position, it's fine. All right? Because everything is solid. There's no stress or pressure. Well, I shouldn't say there's no stress. Or, there is stress or pressure, but it's, it's safe stress and compression on the joints. But as soon as you, fl you flex, like as soon as you get the flexion, you're compressing discs, all right? You're compressing discs, which can push up against nerves. That's when we start to get pain. That's when we get... She's great form. She never does that. I watch her. And she's always got back pain? She, no, occasionally she'll have back pain. And it may be from something else, and her husband thinks it's from that. I don't know. I mean, that's... I, I'm questioning that because then I kind of got, I became afraid to even yeah. use that exercise with anybody. Yeah, I'm really, so, so the, if you didn't hear her right, she was just talking about how with the Romanian, Romanian deadlift, her, her friend's chiropractic uh, husband, you know, is not a big fan of it because of, he sees a lot of injuries like that. And I don't think it's, it's, it's not the exercise that's doing the injuring. I think it's the inability of people to get in the right position that is probably doing the injuring. I mean, I, you got to touch people. You got to feel them. Like, I put my hand right on my clients' backs. And I get a feel. I have them put their hand on my back. You know, so they get, here's right, here's wrong, like unloaded, so they get a feel, because it's all, it's all a little bit of biofeedback, because they have to know what position to get into. And it's, it, and it's all, like I said, it's a progression. Like you don't, like there's a whole bunch of exercises we can do 
before we get to Romanian deadlifts, you know. So, but for, for me, it's like for, for the back, like working the hamstrings, if I'm going to take a, if I want a Romanian deadlift or a leg curl, I'm taking a Romanian deadlift every time, yeah. every time, okay? Hamstring flexibility has a lot to do with that too. Uh, yes, it does. Particularly high hamstring. Yep, yeah. yeah. If they're inflexible, they're the slightest little thing will pull that pelvis out of the line. Yeah, high hamstrings for sure would limit it, but, but the exercise in itself, you play with the tempos, so if I do like a 3-3-3 a three, three, three tempo, three seconds up, three seconds down, three seconds like holding in the middle position, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to help our dynamic flexibility. Also a little ART wouldn't, uh, wouldn't hurt either. Okay. Okay, twisting back extensions. Here we got some, uh, not supposed to be audio with that one. So up and around, the hands happy by the ears. That gives us the lever to torque our spine. Okay, so it's, so we, and we start rotating. Okay, we start rotating. When you're, when you're in that forward flex position, you don't come up and rotate. You start rotating right from your forward flex position. Okay, so it's, it's rotation and extension at the exact same time. Okay, we got time for, uh, we got time for a couple of uh, exercises that I've never seen before. Yeah. Anybody want to share, uh, anybody want to share uh, their uh, the Swiss ball exercise, the billy ball, med ball exercise with us that we could uh, take home and uh, utilize? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. We're on camera. You'll get a residual. <laughs> no? No? Come on, guys. You guys must have one exercise. Off-centered crunches. No. You, could, you probably do those. Off-centered crunches? Off -centered Come on up and show me an off-centered no, crunch. I no, I, I just uh, I, 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 It's a good oblique well, sure, exercise. Sure. OK. Jack Jackknife, off-center jackknife. Come on. Here we go. I think everybody does this, so I don't think this would be anything new. No? Go I ahead. I don't know if I particularly want to do it up here. It's just, it's very simple. And then you can go into a pike. Right. Which I'm not going to do up here. Okay, hold, hold, hold on a second. Come, 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 come back here. I'm going to fix you. <laughs> Come on, come on back in here. You okay. go, you go back in that position again. Okay, uh, the, the uh, jackknife. So, so start, start farther back so you don't go off the stage. Yeah. Because um, that's a concern. <laughs> yeah, that's a concern. Even though I'm short. <laughs> okay, just to, here, just uh, up in the small back a bit. There we go. Okay, so show me your jackknife. Oh. Jackknife. Okay. So does anybody know what I'm going to say? Okay. So her, your, your back is rising up. Your back is rising up too high. We want to keep your back there. Now pull your knees in. Okay, so you're a little tight. Oh. Okay, come on back down. That's it. Try and keep it lower. Oh no, see, I was pull. raising it up all the time. Yeah, no, you don't want to be raised up. All right, we want to keep it lower. Then the other thing we do, can you, can you keep going there? The other thing that we do. With, with our athletes is we will tie, right, we'll tie a band around their feet or a Kaiser cable around their ankles to do, to do some high speed hip, uh, hip flexion in the, uh, in the jackknife, which is kind of cool. And then we'll get them the, their hands raised up a little bit so they can get even more range as they power through. You got one? Here we go. Now we're rolling. What do we got? Okay, I need two balls. Need two balls. Oh, this is a big ball. Here. You want a smaller one? Here. Yeah, here's a smaller one. Yeah. Here, hold is on a second. Smaller? No. No, I think a smaller ball. How about a med ball? Can you do it with a med ball? No. <laughs> no. Yeah? Okay. All right, I'll try. I'll try. Yeah. Oh, is that smaller? 
I can see the idea of it. Okay. Is this the, how about this one? No, we'll just try it. Okay, we'll just try it. Okay, and it goes between my legs. I'm okay. Here. This is wrong, but, and then you do back extension. Reverse extension with a ball squeezing. So I like this. This is like the, uh, my picture, the reverse hyper. So what are we doing now? We are, we are tying in her AD ductors with hip extension, which is a, which is a great, uh, a great idea because a ductor magnus works. A lot of people don't realize this, but a ductor, her, the ductor magnus works with the hamstrings to assist in hip extension. It's not just an adductor, but it works in hip extension. So it's a, it's a more functional way of, uh, of tying, uh, tying it all in together. Excellent, uh, excellent move. And yeah, you could have done that with a medicine ball. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I gave, you my, I gave you my exercises. I don't have an exercise. I just have a question. Do you use tubes much with the ball or? Yeah, we'll use, we'll use tubes. Like you know, it just depends on on the uh, on the application and you know what we're trying to uh, what we're trying to achieve. With, with the rotation. Yeah, yeah. Like we'll do we'll do Russian twists with uh, not necessarily tubes. We'll actually use a cable. Uh, like I, cause I've got cables all over the place. We use cables, but but if you you hook a tube up, you can do Russian twists with uh, with, with a tube and bars. And I mean. There's nothing wrong. You can't do anything wrong. As long as you're safe and you're thinking about your progressions and you've, uh, you know, you, you've programmed it out right, there's, there's nothing that you, you can't, really, uh, can't really do. Okay. Well, we're reaching the, uh, the end, of, uh, end of this lecture. Um, I hope you guys got some, uh, some positive ideas that you can take back to your own facilities, integrate in, make you rethink what you do. And, uh, and know that your clients, know that your clients, I use this, you, this is example in my, last, uh, in my last lecture, but this guy, as you can see, he goes way back. This is Batman in 1943. And his training techniques were a little different. He bought the book. He trained hard. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. I'll be uh, hanging around uh, outside if you have any other questions. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day.